Lately, I've had some really busy days. I mean, the kind where I look up from my computer, realize it's the end of the day, and I've totally skipped lunch. For days when my meetings are back to back, or if I just need a quick break, I've been loving Daily Harvest. Daily Harvest delivers delicious food built on organic fruits and vegetables right to your door. It takes just a few minutes to prepare, and I've never had to question if the food I'm eating is good for me. With Daily Harvest, there's an option for any time of day. Smoothies for breakfast, crisp flatbreads for lunch or dinner, and comfort food for when the weather starts to cool down, like their perfectly roasted harvest bowls and hearty soups. My favorite bowl is the sweet potato and wild rice hash. It's very yummy, and I don't need to add anything to it. Daily Harvest makes it easy to eat clean, undeniably delicious food, no matter what your day brings. Keep it simple with Daily Harvest. Go to dailyharvest.com and enter promo code RESPECTABLE to get $25 off your first box. That's promo code RESPECTABLE for $25 off your first box at dailyharvest.com. Dailyharvest.com. I believe reading labels is key. I do it with everything, from the food I buy to the beauty products I use. Even my deodorant from Native. My Native deodorant doesn't just block odor better, it's made better. Native has ingredients you've heard of, like coconut oil, shea butter, and tapioca starch. It's also vegan and never tested on animals. With over 10 cents, including rotating seasonals, Native has something for everyone. Their most popular classic scents are coconut and vanilla, lavender and rose, cucumber and mint, and citrus and herbal musk. My favorite scent is the coconut and vanilla. And I'll be honest with you, I was very hesitant about switching my deodorants, but Native provides the same reliable coverage and without clogging my sweat glands. Native is risk-free to try. Every product comes with free shipping within the U.S., plus free 30-day returns and exchanges. See why so many people love Native and check out the over 14,000 five-star reviews. You can also check out the Native newsletter for updates. Do what I did and make the switch to Native today by going to nativedo.com slash ratchet or use promo code ratchet at checkout and get 20% off your first order. That's nativedo.com slash ratchet or use promo code ratchet at checkout for 20% off your first order. Hi everyone, I'm caught up in work this week, but I thought it would be a good time to revisit the episode This Is America, which aired in June. I hope you enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, you're listening to Ratchet and Respectable with Demetria L. Lucas. Whew. What a week. It's really hard doing a podcast right now. If a month feels like a year, every day feels like a week. I could probably do a podcast episode every day if I had the bandwidth and if I had the time to tape and edit. And when I pull these episodes together each week, it's just me. I don't have an assistant or a producer or an editor. I try to be thorough and cover the big stories, but... I feel like right now, everything is a big story. There are protests of police violence and racial injustice in literally every state in the country, multiple cities in some places. There's violence in so many cities and not necessarily because the protesters are violent. It's the police. It's crazy. Minneapolis looks like a war zone. In D.C., D.C. is not a state. So Trump and his Trump and his merry band of idiots have called in the military on D.C. They're playing some sort of reindeer war games with the city. Earlier this week, I'm taping this on Wednesday, which I feel important to say because news moves so fast. By Thursday afternoon, when this podcast publishes, it may be completely irrelevant. But on Monday, the occupant of the White House gassed peaceful protesters because he wanted to take a photo op in a nearby church. 
And now they're denying that they gassed the protesters. They were like, no, we used X, Y, Z. We didn't tear gas them. But the X, Y, Z they're referring to is a form of tear gas. That move has been wildly and widely condemned, including by church clergy. There was a priest out of Arizona. He gave Trump a filthy read for that stunt, for showing up in front of the church to hold up the Bible, which, by the way, it's not very far-fetched to believe Trump would do something Hitler-esque, but that Trump and Hitler picture that shows Hitler holding up the Bible, and they're like, this is why Trump wanted to hold up the Bible. That picture is photoshopped. In the original image, Hitler's not holding anything. He's just holding up his hand, just FYI. But this priest from Arizona was pissed. He gave Trump a whole holy read about that stunt. Can I read it to you? This is Father Robert Hendrickson. He is the rector at St. Philip's in the Hills Episcopal Church. This is what he said, quote, This is an awful man waving a book he hasn't read in front of a church he doesn't attend, invoking laws he doesn't understand against fellow Americans he sees as enemies, wielding a military he dodged serving to protect power he gained via accepting foreign interference, exploiting fear and anger he loves to stoke, after failing to address a pandemic he was warned about and building it all on a bed of constant lies and childish inanity. This is not partisan. It is simply about recognizing the moral vacuum that is now pretending to lead. He called that man a moral vacuum. This is a beautiful piece of writing. Was the priest an English major? Because that's not just theology. Like, sir, that is an excellent use of the king's English. He used some beautiful words to tell the occupant, your arms are too short to box with God. You're reaching, but your arms are too short. Father Hendrickson. But in D.C., military forces have taken over the streets. They're National Guard trucks all over the city. They got the big guns out this time. And helicopters. Trump ordered a low-flying helicopter over the protesters outside of Lafayette Park, which is directly in front of the White House. All the scenes you see protesting from D.C., it's in front of Lafayette Park. They've since blocked off this park. But he ordered a low-flying helicopter to go over the protesters So it would stir up all the trash and blow it around. It would be super windy to disperse the protesters. It's a war tactic used on civilians on American soil in the nation's capital outside of the White House. The fuck is going on? Same White House. On Tuesday, they erected this eight or nine foot fence outside of the park to keep people away from the White House. If you heard the story over the weekend, the protesters scared Trump security so bad that they took him and the family down to the bunker. Trump has since said that he went down to the bunker to survey it and Obama left it empty and messy. Sir, you've been in office three years. It's not like Obama left last week. In three years, why ain't nobody from your staff go down to the bunker and stock it or clean it up? That's a you problem, sir. But he was like, oh, I just went down there to survey it and take a look around. You just happened to do that when there's thousands of people protesting outside the White House and that's before they backed the barriers up behind the park? Okay. Today, they pushed the barrier back another block or maybe two. I was out there protesting yesterday. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the barrier was right at the edge of the park. Now they pushed it back and then put two military trucks in the middle of the street so the protesters can't see the White House and the White House can't see the protesters. I don't know if that's ever been done before. I know the helicopter hasn't for sure. That's caused a big fuss too. People are distancing themselves from the photo op and from the helicopter like, "Mm -mm, we didn't know. We didn't know that was going to happen. D.C. is under siege from this fool. D.C. needs its statehood bad right now. The mayor has no control over the city. Trump is treating it as his personal playground to play his war games. One of these games also happened on Monday night. It's a woman named Allison Lane. She was protesting outside of the White House on Monday. You know what? I'm just going to read you her tweets because it's crazy. She says, 
I'm at a house in D.C. after being pepper sprayed and knocked down by the police. There are about 100 of us in a house surrounded by cops. All the neighbors on the street open their doors and are tending to protesters. The cops corralled us on the street and sprayed us down. Lots of people are hurt, but not terribly. They chased us away from the White House with flashbangs into a residential neighborhood. Nobody is really sure when we'll be able to leave. The cops are trying to tell us we won't be arrested if we leave the house. Also, now, the cops are trying to say we broke into the house. We didn't. Seriously, we're in these people's basement singing Kirk Franklin Revolution. For those asking, we're okay. We all were handed flyers with legal aid and advice, mass first aid kits. Honestly, ready to get arrested. They're lining people up outside for God only knows what. Okay, they're arresting people, zip tying them and taking them away. Looks like I'm here until 6 a.m. The cops are in the alley catching people who hop the fence to leave the private property. Helicopters are everywhere. This is insane. The cops are in the yard and just arrested someone trying to get in. Otherwise, it's still pretty quiet. Just waiting this out. I've talked to a few other people. There are at least four houses I'm certain that let people in. Mind you, we weren't trying to be in a neighborhood. We got pushed here while peacefully protesting. Cops just lied and said someone called 911 and they need to enter the home. Not today, fam. Just talk to the homeowner. Raul is a boss, works in healthcare. All he's asking is if you can get us food and water, we'll be straight. He's got a network of medical professionals ready to help us. He's the real hero here. Protesters are requesting escorts at 6 a.m. to make sure we're able to leave safely and get home. Northwest D.C., there's a ton of us. They have buses outside waiting to arrest us. Also, we just got pizza delivered. Thanks, Raul. The cops keep sending fake people to the door trying to get in the house. Raul is not with the shits. If you want to know what the homeowner thinks, he's talking to WTOP right now. Someone called a lawyer to the house, trying to see if we can get him past the police to advise us. At 6 a.m., they were able to leave the house. One of my friends, actually, who lives in D.C., she was like, I couldn't go to sleep. I was up all night thinking of them. And she was like, I just showed up at 6 a.m. not knowing what to expect. Like, y'all need a ride. Y'all need water. Y'all need food. So they all got home safely. They were not arrested, the people that stayed in the house. And dear Raul... God bless this man. Like, all heroes don't wear capes. He's done a couple interviews. And in one of them, the interviewer asked him, they were like, well, why would you let all these people into your house? And he was like, why wouldn't I? That's crazy. And he was like, is it? I feel like 90% of people would have done the same thing. When I was protesting the other day, we passed Swan Street. And I looked down the block. It's like at least 20 houses on the block. In, Man in Allison's recounting of the story, she says she knows about four other houses that let people in. That's what, quick math, 25%? 90% of people would not let a whole bunch of strangers in their house. They wouldn't let one stranger in their house, much less 60, 70, 100 of them. That man's a saint. He might not know it, but he is. An another interview, they were like, well, you know, what were you thinking? And he was like, I was thinking that these are young people who are out here protesting for Black Lives Matter. They're out here fighting for justice and freedom like they're doing good work. Why would I not support them? He said, I'd be honored if my child grew up to be like these protesters that I allowed into my home. Man's a saint. But this story is nuts. So I read this story and the first thing that came to my mind, I was like, what in the Anne Frank is happening here? You hiding people away in the basement instead of the attic trying to keep them from the police? That's nuts. When I posted it on Instagram, people were like, this sounds like the Underground Railroad. You got to hide people in your basement to keep the cops away from them? That's nuts. Nuts. But here we are in America, the nation's capital in 2020. Something else happened crazy in D.C. I saw this video of two kids, teenagers, 13, 14, maybe protesting down by the White House. It was a black boy and he hopped the security gates and he walked up to the police in riot gear and he knelt in front of them with his arms up, hands up, don't shoot. 
And quickly behind him, a little white girl with this gigantic book bag hops over the fence and she shields the black kid with her body. The police approach, she turns around and she literally uses her body to cover him. The police officer walked up and and tapped the boy on the shoulder and sent the kids back over the fence without anything happening to them. But I was watching the scene play out like my heart is in my chest when this when this black kid hops over to confront the police. And then even when the girl came and she's shielding him, this is a 12, 13, maybe 14 tops. And that's pushing it. Hops over the fence and shields this kid with her body. These kids are putting their lives on the line. These protesters that you see all around the country are putting their lives on the line. We're having nationwide protests in the middle of a global pandemic. I watch CNN all day and most of the night, and everyone talks about the protests nonstop, which is weird because for three months we were talking about COVID-19 nonstop. And then people just got tired of talking about COVID, and it's like it went away, but it didn't. And yet people are outside in the middle of a global pandemic, hopping their happy asses across the fence to confront police in riot gear. Between dear Allison and the 60 to 70 other people who were in Raul's house and then the other people that were in the other three or four houses and then the helicopters flying low like we're in a war zone and Trump gassing, peacefully protesting American citizens outside the White House for a fucking photo op. I was like, I have to get up. I have to do something. I have to go downtown. I have to protest. So I woke up Tuesday morning and I went in the kitchen. My mom was making breakfast and my dad was sitting in the his lazy boy in the family room. And I announced to my parents at the same time, mind you, I don't live in Maryland. I live in L.A. I've been here for three months, neither here nor there. And I announced to my parents, I'm going down to protest. My mom doesn't say a word. My dad is like, WTH. He's not with the shit. And I was like, no, like I need to do more. I can't watch kids put their lives on the line and me grown ass, able bodied, healthy in good condition. Me not go out there when I could just because I don't want to risk anything. They're out there risking things. This, this woman, Allison, I don't know her. She put her life on the line and a strange man let 60, 70 people stay overnight in his house to shield them from the police. These are the kinds of extreme measures that people are taking. I can get off my ass and go march. I can get off my ass and go yell until I'm hoarse. It's literally the least I can do. So I give this passionate speech to my parents and my father doesn't even say anything. He just gives me the like, well, girl, I guess. Look, My mother finally pipes in and she was like, all right, so I'm going to pour milk in a bottle and you need some water and don't wear your combat boots. You need sneakers you can run in and this and this and this and this and this. And I was like, really? You know that much about protesting? Really, mommy? Like we've been to a protest together before, but just the way she said it, I was like, do you have like some extensive history of protesting? Really? So I put all the things that she suggested in a bag and I had my father write our home telephone number on my arm with a black Sharpie. He was so upset about the whole thing. Poor thing. He miswrote. He got the area code right. The first number of our phone number or two, he couldn't write it. He like messed it up and I had to go wash it off real quick and try it again. I realized what the issue was, and I actually felt bad. I shouldn't have my dad do that. Write your number on your forearm because if you are unable to communicate for whatever reason, someone can call your contact and identify you and alert them that you are in distress. So if I'm unable to call, then I'm either knocked out, passed out, dead. Very morbid. To do over, I would have just written the number myself. That's kind of a lot to ask for your parents to like, write out your phone number in case somebody needs to call me to say my child is incapacitated or dead. Yeah. I went downtown. It was a very peaceful protest. As soon as I walked up, this woman um, came up to me and she's like, would you like a protest bag? And I was like, I'm sorry. And she was like a protest bag. And she gave me this giant Ziploc bag with water, milk, a towel, maybe hand sanitizer, a nutrition bar. So I was like, um, okay. I had everything in the bag with me. I took it. So with, while I was out, I saw someone in need. I can hand it off to them. So I got downtown around two. 
we protested at the White House for about an hour, and then we marched um, from the White House up to 14th and U, and then went a block over and came back down. It was good. Very organized. The leaders of the protest, I still haven't figured out their names. I took pictures of them, but no one's been able to ID them so far. A crowd of thousands being led by the two main guys, two young black guys. They look like they were probably 25, which means they're probably like 30, 31, because, you know, black people. But each of them had that it factor of leadership. That rare combination of confidence and passion and intensity and I actually know what I'm doing, but they were really good. Both of them had that it and I was like, I would follow them anywhere, almost. Because as we got closer to the White House, the march split into two groups. One group with the guys that I'm ranting, with the guys that I'm raving about, they went to the MLK Memorial and then the other group went back to the White House. I kind of wanted to go to MLK, but it was around 630 and DC has a curfew of seven down by MLK Memorial. There's not a close metro and the city streets are blocked off in so many places. I didn't know how crazy the cops were going to act once curfew hit. So I wanted to make sure that I was still close to a metro. So I went back to the White House and I protested until around 655 and then I went home. It was interesting It was crowded when I got there, but more people came as the day progressed. And by the end, by the White House, I was standing probably like five rows back, right, like directly in front of the White House on the other side of the the park. It was like 10% of color. I mean, mostly black, but it was like 90% white. Like it wasn't so white that I could look around and like not see another black person, but it'd be like, oh, there's two. There's, oh, there's two over there, three together. Okay. It was white, white, which is fine. I said last week, this is white people's problem to solve. Sitting in a crowd of thousands where you are in the vast minority as a black person listening to white people chant Black Lives Matter is some weird shit. Not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying that's some shit I ain't never experienced before. And it took me like a good, I don't know if I ever really got comfortable with it. Like I was glad it was happening. I want it to continue to happen. I'm not mad at white folks who want to go protest for my black life. Thank you. It's going to take some a while to get used to this one. This is new. George Floyd's name was chanted over and over and over for obvious reasons. Breonna Taylor, uh, the young woman who was killed in Louisville, she was at home asleep with her boyfriend and cops showed up, bust in the house. Boyfriend had a gun because he thought they were getting robbed. He let one off and the cops shot her multiple times. I want to say like seven. She died. No police officers have been charged in her murder. Oh, update, because we talked about this a couple podcasts ago. The charges were dropped against the boyfriend, which was great because he didn't do anything wrong. He he thought with good reason that that someone was breaking into his home. He had no idea it was police officers with a no-knock warrant and that they had been given poor information because they were looking for a trap house and they ran up on two working people. I want to say Brianna was an EMT. She did something. She was working on the front line. She was an essential worker fighting COVID. So her name came up equally as often as George Floyd, which I was very glad to hear. Black women also are harassed and abused and murdered by police. Rihanna Taylor is not the first one. Sandra Bland was not the first one. There are many women whose names have become hashtags because they were murdered by the police, but they don't seem to get the same level of attention that black men who are murdered by the police get. But their lives are equally as important. So I was very pleased to hear Breonna Taylor's name mentioned so much at the protest. I heard Ahmaud Arbery's name once. I was out there till six o'clock before his name came up. They chanted it once and then moved on to another chant. Lately, I've had some really busy days. I mean, the kind where I look up from my computer, realize it's the end of the day, and I've totally skipped lunch. 
for days when my meetings are back to back, or if I just need a quick break, I've been loving Daily Harvest. Daily Harvest delivers delicious food built on organic fruits and vegetables right to your door. It takes just a few minutes to prepare, and I've never had to question if the food I'm eating is good for me. With Daily Harvest, there's an option for any time of day. Smoothies for breakfast, crisp flatbreads for lunch or dinner, and comfort food for when the weather starts to cool down, like their perfectly roasted harvest bowls and hearty soups. My favorite bowl is the sweet potato and wild rice hash. It's very yummy, and I don't need to add anything to it. Daily Harvest makes it easy to eat clean, undeniably delicious food, no matter what your day brings. Keep it simple with Daily Harvest. Go to dailyharvest.com and enter promo code RESPECTABLE to get $25 off your first box. That's promo code RESPECTABLE for $25 off your first box at dailyharvest.com. Dailyharvest.com. The holiday season is right around the corner, and this year, we know that people will be buying more stuff online than ever before. If you're an e-commerce seller, are you ready to meet the demands of a record-breaking online shopping season? Be ready with ShipStation. It's the fastest, easiest, and most affordable way to manage and ship my orders. I've been talking about doing these signed books for Don't Waste Your Pretty for a couple months now. ShipStation is my go-to to get those books to you on time. No matter where you're selling, Amazon, Etsy, your own website, that would be me. ShipStation brings all your orders into one simple interface. It's no wonder ShipStation is the number one choice of online sellers. You'll ship more in less time with the best rates available. And right now, Ratchet and Respectable listeners can try ShipStation free for 60 days when you use offer code RESPECT. Make sure your business is ready to meet the demands of a massive online shopping season. Get started at ShipStation.com today. Click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in RESPECT. That's ShipStation.com. Then enter offer code RESPECT. ShipStation.com. Make ship happen. Shortly before I began recording today, the big news story was that the officer initially charged in the George Floyd case, the one with his knee on, on Floyd's neck, he was initially charged with third degree murder. It has since been upgraded to second degree. The other three officers are now being charged as accessories to second degree murder. Amy Klobuchar, who had the opportunity to prosecute the officer that knelt on George Floyd's neck and murdered him. She is the one who released the statement, not the attorney general who earlier this week, George Floyd's case was kicked up to him. It's also a black guy. But Amy Klobuchar popped out there with a tweet to be like, hey, here's the tea. Instead of letting the state attorney general announce it or his office. I think she thinks that she could possibly still be in the runnings for VP. There were a lot of news stories a couple weeks ago about how she was being vetted by Biden's team and and that she was a forerunner. If you have any involvement in in the Minneapolis Police Department right now, you're a rap. Sis, you there's no way in possible hell you will be VP. Let that go, babe. Let that go. I'm glad that the other three officers are being arrested. I just want a conviction. What I really don't want is four months or six months or nine months from now, however long it takes for this case to to go to trial and then for a trial to be completed. I really don't want to see these officers get off. And even though it's on video, I mean, Rodney King was on video. Those cops got off. So... I think the charges for the other officers are great. I think the charge being upped for this officer, if they can prove it, I think that's great. But so many times we've seen people charged, we've seen people arrested, and then we've seen them walk free. At one point, I thought if an arrest was made, if not for one officer, all three, it might quell the protest. I think if it had happened within like the first day or two, you might have avoided nationwide protests and you might have avoided this issue growing beyond George Floyd, which it has. Police brutality, police murder, 
the systemic racism and inequality in this country has now been pushed to the forefront. People are marching as much for George Floyd and for police murder as they are for the rights of black people to, you know, exist for the protest to end. There needs to be some change. It can't just end because there were charges. It can't just end because there will be three more arrests. That's great for the George Floyd case, but but this is way bigger than George Floyd now. Something needs to actually change, especially in the police force, because the police are out of control. George Floyd's death is just one of many. Off the top of my head, I can probably name 12 to 15 black people who whose names were turned into hashtags. That's not okay. Black people have been dealing with senseless deaths among us since we arrived on American shores in 1619. It's been 401 years. Enough is enough. There are too many cops who are corrupt or just flat out crazy. I mean, think about this. We are in the middle of a global pandemic. People are so upset about the treatment of black people by police that they've taken to the streets in every state in the country. There are international protests because other places got their own issues. Like Paris had a gigantic protest earlier today. On the same day that, uh, that George Floyd was killed because a police officer kneeled on his neck, there's a picture circulating of a man in Paris who the police kneeled on his neck too. I believe he survived. But there's an image circulating on social media of the picture side by side. White French cop kneeling on the neck of a black man. I saw the video too. But he eventually takes it off. London, John Boy- Boyega. Let me look that up. The black actor from Star Wars, he was at the protest in London. He got on the bullhorn. And this is London's second protest. This was earlier today. He lit that shit up. He was on social media making declarative statements. He said, fuck racist. (laughs) He took some flack from that. And he was like, I don't give a fuck. (laughs) Bruv, it's about that life. Mistreatment of black people was an issue worldwide. America just happens to be the face of it right now. But those other countries who are protesting along with us, those crowds were majority white, but it was a lot of black people there too. Police brutality and racism is familiar to them as well. It may manifest itself in different ways because it's a different culture, but it's not unfamiliar. I say that to say that even with thousands, thousands and thousands of people taking to the streets In the middle of international protests about the mistreatment of black people by police. You know what police are doing right now? They still stomping the fuck out of black people. They still killing black people in the middle of protests to stop killing black people. Earlier this week, Louisville, the police fired into a crowd. The man they hit, beloved figure in the community. He was the barbecue man. Everybody loved that man. They can't find nobody in the city to say a negative word about him. All sorts of politicians, city council people said beautiful, lovely words about this man. He was a joy and a treasure to all who knew him. And the police killed him dead. I don't think an arrest has even been made for that one. But at a protest over police killing black people, police killed a black person. That's Louisville. Just in the last week since George Floyd's murder, since these protests began, I didn't even Google to see everything. I just made notes of the things that stood out to me. Baltimore Police Department. There's a video circulating. I put it on my Instagram. There's a woman who is very clearly and distinctly having some sort of mental episode in the streets of Baltimore. She hauls off and punches him in the face. Not once, twice. A black officer comes up, punches her so hard in the face that she hits the ground immediately. A mentally ill woman. There's two videos circulating. One just shows the police interaction. There's another one that's about eight minutes circulating that precedes that one. I put the update in the link on my page. So if you'd like to see it, please go to my page on Instagram at Demetria L. Lucas. But you can see that this woman is clearly having a mental episode. That's probably why the first police officer didn't react when she punched him. Not the first time or the second time. A black cop 
didn't give a fuck, punched her dead in her face. Atlanta Police Department on live TV, whole bunch of officers just run up on this car. Two people in their 20s, a man and a woman sitting in the car, man behind the wheel, woman in the passenger seat. It's a row of cars. In the wide shot, you can see the car in front of them, at least in the passenger window, is a white girl. She's filming. She's so happy and comfortable. She's waving at the cameras. But they run up on this one specific car. They're banging on the window. They're trying to get them to open the doors. The kids are confused because they're like, what's going on? Why are we being attacked? What's happening? Like, you must have the wrong people. The police snatch open the door trying to get the girl out. The boy tries to hold on to her. Obviously, he can't. They snatched her out. That girl's screams are haunting. Haunting. She screamed like somebody was trying to kill her because she thought she was about to die. They bust open the windows in the car trying to get to the boy. They tase the fuck out that kid. It was bad on the wide shot from TV. The body cams were released from the police officers. I watched that once. I cried. I cried for how they did that boy. That was wrong. Two of the police officers were fired almost immediately earlier today. Or was it yesterday? I also heard that the police were being charged. A list of charges. Good. Because they were wrong. They were wrong, wrong, wrong. And them two kids, I call them kids because they're students at Morehouse and Spelman. They're young enough to literally be my kids. They're going to suit a fuck out the city of Atlanta. As they should. Minneapolis. We watched a CNN reporter get arrested on live TV. He showed his credentials. He said, I'm with the press. Because it's being shown on live TV, that means standing with him was someone with a big ass camera. It also means a producer was there. It also means a security guard was there. It means all four of them had CNN credentials. When the police approached them, they said, we're with CNN. We're with CNN. When they started to arrest the black reporter, they said, we are on live TV. You are streaming live on CNN. They didn't give a fuck. They arrested him. There was a white reporter also reporting. He said he saw police and they were like, who you with? CNN. They were like, all right. And they just kept it pushing. But they decided to arrest the black guy. Mind you, at that time, they still hadn't arrested the cop who was kneeling on George Floyd's neck. They were like, oh, we have to do an investigation. We have to do this. We have to do that. You ain't got to do all that because you saw a reporter in the middle of the street and you felt like arresting him. So you did. You had no cause. But you arrested him nonetheless. But with the cops, you got to do all this extra shit. All this extra shit for cops. But civilians, you just do it on the spot. Really? Same thing happened to my friend. Works for Vice. And Vice News is doing amazing, amazing coverage of the protests right now. But my friend on the June 1st episode, he's out in Minneapolis covering the protests. Was with his team, cameraman, producer, at least. All have press badges. Got arrested nonetheless. There's a a widely circulated video of an NYPD officer. There's a girl in the street and he just pushes her. She goes flying into the street. I read that she had a head injury. She had to go to the hospital. Like, what? I saw another video in Brooklyn, NYPD, officer in a truck. He wants to go forward. There's a crowd in front of the car. So he just plows the truck into the protesters, puts his foot on the accelerator and plows into a bunch of people. Who does that? NYPD. I've seen countless videos of officers all around the country. They go up to people and pull down their masks so they can tear gas them directly in the face. That's crazy. Saw a picture from LAPD. Officer just runs into a protester, sees him, runs into the protester, sees he hits the protester, and then backs the car up and drives away. How is this acceptable? How? These issues have to be addressed. In order for the protests to stop, you can't have the police out here acting like this. They're out here acting like a gang. And they do this with no one checking them. Gangs have police trying to stop them. Who do the police have trying to stop them? It's not other police. I saw two videos circulating of police officers checking other police officers. One was a a white cop. I don't know what city it was, but he was just going in on somebody and a black female officer pulled him off and dressed him down in front of everyone. She went off. 
There was another one. I saw a police officer kneeling on someone's neck. The officer who was with him literally pushed his knee off the person's neck. We're in a protest about somebody who died because an officer's knee was on their neck. And then another officer goes and puts a knee on someone's neck. We can't live like this. And these are just the stories that come to mind. So no, the protest can't end here. We need real change and we don't have it yet. We need to go out and get it. We need real reform in our police department. And we need to protest and make noise and raise hell until we get it. I believe reading labels is key. I do it with everything, from the food I buy to the beauty products I use. Even my deodorant from Native. My Native deodorant doesn't just block odor better, it's made better. Native has ingredients you've heard of, like coconut oil, shea butter, and tapioca starch. It's also vegan and never tested on animals. With over 10 cents, including rotating seasonals, Native has something for everyone. Their most popular classic scents are coconut and vanilla, lavender and rose, cucumber and mint, and citrus and herbal musk. My favorite scent is the coconut and vanilla. And I'll be honest with you, I was very hesitant about switching my deodorants, but Native provides the same reliable coverage and without clogging my sweat glands. Native is risk-free to try. Every product comes with free shipping within the U.S., plus free 30-day returns and exchanges. See why so many people love Native and check out the over 14,000 five-star reviews. You can also check out the Native newsletter for updates. Do what I did and make the switch to Native today by going to nativedo.com slash ratchet or use promo code ratchet at checkout and get 20% off your first order. That's nativedo.com slash ratchet or use promo code ratchet at checkout for 20% off your first order. This election is one of the most critical times in history to make our voices heard and accounted for. Decision makers nationwide are passing laws to make it harder to cast a ballot in person. Don't let this stop you from making a plan to vote in person and reporting problems at the polls. They will not silence us. If you are not sure if you are registered to vote or you experience problems getting to cast your vote in person, please call the Election Protection Hotline at 866-OUR-VOTE. Visit andstillivote.org to join the fight for voting rights today. Paid for by the Leadership Conference Education Fund. I have a special guest on today's episode. She is one of my favorite humans on the planet. I have been begging her to come on the show probably since the first episode. She is none other than my beloved mom. Please welcome my mother to Ratchet and Respectable. I wanted to ask you questions about the civil rights movement because you have been to protest before and you gave me really good tips before I went to a protest earlier today. How old were you when you went to your first protest? I was probably five or six years old. What? Five or six. Why were you at a protest when you were five or six? We lived in a city in Michigan called Bay City, Michigan, and there was a skating rink that would not allow black people, black teenagers, to skate during the week. And the protest was to be able to skate when they wanted to skate. So we picketed the skating rink. We as in? I was with my parents, and there were other people from the church and community as well. Do you remember the protest? I vaguely remember that one. What do you remember about it? I remember marching around, quoting something, but I knew that we wanted to skate and they wouldn't allow us to skate. How did that make you feel at five? I didn't understand fully. Shortly after our protest, they opened it up so we could skate whenever. And that's how I learned how to roller skate. I didn't know you knew how to roller skate. A little bit, yes. Can you do like tricks? No. Oh, but you can like stay upright and not like run into things. Yes. Can you stop? Yes. Oh, I had no idea. How do I not know this about you? I took you roller skating. I can't skate. But I didn't skate. Why didn't you teach me how to skate? You were with your friends. Well, why didn't you teach me how to skate some other... Okay, we're getting derailed. When was your next protest, Mommy? Probably with Martin Luther King. He came to Detroit, and we marched 
in Detroit. We as in you and your parents? I don't know that mom was there, but I know dad was always with my father. Yeah, we were down there walking. And you, so you marched at a Martin Luther King protest? Yes. What do you remember about the protest? Just marching down the street. Which street was it? Probably Woodward. In Detroit? Woodward Avenue in Detroit. Okay, that's like a main thoroughfare? Yes. It was hella black people out? Oh, yeah. Like tons of black people? Yes. Because it was Detroit? Yes. You don't remember anything else about it? No. Just a lot of people. How old were you again? I was a little older then, probably 9, 10, or 11. And your mother was fine with you going to a protest at 9, 10 years old? Yeah. Why? I was with my father. Did the protest get violent? No. It was peaceful. Okay. What about after that? After that, uh, there were riots in Detroit. What were the riots over? The riots on 12th Street, probably in 1967. The police raided a place not far from our home, and riots broke out after that. I make a distinction between a riot and a protest. I, I feel like a protest is peaceful. People have signs. You're shaking your head. A riot and a protest are not. Well, yes, they are different. I think those were the only protests that I attended. But you specifically referred to this one as a riot. It was a riot. Why did you call it a riot? They burned Detroit. What do you mean they burned Detroit? Someone threw a Molotov cocktail into a building and the place caught on fire. And they began looting all the stores on that street and setting them on fire. And 12th Street was, what is an equivalent of 12th Street that people now would understand? Like Georgetown? Like a row of shops like that? It was a row of shops, Black-owned shops. They looted the Black-owned shops? Yes. Black people? Yes. That's not a good idea. No, it was not. Was there other violence at the protest or at the riot? I only recall the looting and the burning. I don't recall whether or not anyone was killed. Since then, I've, I've read that there were, people were killed in other places around Detroit associated with the riot. So I understand the idea of a child being taken to a protest. Protests are pretty peaceful. They can get a little rowdy, but not too rowdy. Why were you out in a riot? I was with my father. Your father took you out in a riot. My father was a minister, mm -hmm. and he went down on 12th Street, which was close to our home, the idea being to encourage some of the looters to stop and go home. And he thought it was a good idea to take his... How old were you? 12 or 13. What? Your mother was okay with this? She did not object. Did anyone ask Grandma what she thought? No. Was Grandma awake when y'all left? She was probably in the kitchen cooking. Did she know where y'all were going? Yes. And she didn't say nothing? No, she didn't okay. say nothing. Okay. The whole different set of people that I used to stay with in the summer. I couldn't go off the porch, but you could go to a riot. I was with my father. Would you have let me go to a riot with my father? I would have trusted your father to take care of you. So if my father, if Larry came in here right now and was like, you know what, it's a riot, and me and Demetri are going to head out. It wasn't said like that. It was, we're going down on 12th Street to see what we can do. Did Grandma know there was a riot on 12th Street? Yes, 12th Street was burning. How did y'all know 12th Street was burning if y'all were in the house? You could see the smoke. You could see the smoke from the house. Yes. So you, so y'all knew it was a riot before y'all left the house. And Grandma was in the kitchen and was like, sure, go ahead, have a good time. No, she didn't say all of that. What did she say? She didn't say anything at all. So y'all just said, okay, we're going to head out. And we're, going down, we're going down on 12th Street. Did you ask to go? Your father told you, just come I on. I said, I want to go. And he said, come on. I wanted to see what was going on. So he said, come on. So I kept up with him. And we went down on 12th Street. We found a total mess. They destroyed the stores. Several places were on fire. People were running out of stores with liquor and televisions and mattresses. Mattresses? And a, a sofa. Sofa? A whole sofa? A whole sofa. 
they put on the back of a convertible car and they drove down the street with it. It was it was chaos. There was glass everywhere, and the police were there, but they were afraid to do anything. I shouldn't say they were afraid to do anything. They weren't doing anything. The fire department was not there because uh, they were afraid that they would get shot or hurt trying to put the fires out. So they allowed these places to burn. So my father and I walked down the middle of the street witnessing all of this chaos. Were you scared? No. Because you were with your father? Yes. I mean, he was a big man. I don't think I should have been afraid with my father. I did not feel that he would let anything happen to me. My father knew a lot of people in Detroit. If something were to have happened, they would have gotten him and I out of there. You talk about Grandpa like he was the godfather. No, he was just a minister. Is there another riot that I need to ask you about? Because I feel like we're on with two protests and a riot and you're 13. There was another riot in Detroit, probably after Martin Luther King was killed. They burned stores on Davison and Livernois and Grand River, the Boulevard. The black community and all of those stores and businesses were destroyed. And it has taken all of this time for them to recover. All of this time is in like from 40 years at least. Jesus. You went out in that one? Yes. Where did you go? We went down on Davison and Livernois uh, and Grand River. We drove around. We got out and walked. What did you see? Stores destroyed, burning, buildings burning, people throwing Molotov cocktail bombs, people taking furniture, liquor, everything out of the stores, including dry cleaners. They just taking whatever they could get. Armfuls of clothing, anything they could get. Were you scared? No. Because you were with your father? Yes. Were y'all in a bulletproof car? No. Did he have a gun? Perhaps. Did you have a gun? I did not. Okay, I just, I didn't know where the story was going. Is there another riot you need to tell me about, or was this the last one? I think that was the last one. Were you involved in the riot? Did you loot? No. Okay, because you were with your father? So did he loot? No. <laughs> okay, just checking. He didn't take anything. Okay, did you? Did... In either riot. Okay. What did you learn about protesting at the protest you attended? The protests I attended were peaceful, and they were for a purpose, freedom, the ability to do what we wanted to do when we wanted to do it. I recall gaining that in, in Bay City because, as a kid, I was able to skate later. After Martin Luther King, we got a lot of rights that people took for granted. But in Detroit, we were so, I don't want to say militant, um, but there were so many black people in Detroit, things had to change. During the 60s, they did. I was thinking more along the lines of, what did you learn in terms of like, I don't know, how to protest? Is there a right way to protest? I think peaceful protesting works best, but sometimes in order to be heard, you have to riot. And I think that's what we're seeing now. We've tried taking a knee and we were called names or our athletes were called names and nothing ever came from that. Now, seeing the, the killing of another black man Last month, mm -hmm. there were three separate incidents where black people were killed and nothing was done or said to rectify it. So with the rioting now, maybe our government will listen and implement some changes. I would not advocate to really go out and riot but I understand 
why people are rioting. Can I ask you about the militancy thing? Sure. Why don't you think you're militant? I think that my ideas are pretty much in line with most other Black people. Mommy? Yes. We had a metal Black power fist on the, on the, living, on the, the, the table or the mantle in the family room the entire time I was growing up. I don't know where the fist... Is that the fist? No, that's not the fist. That's the fist right there. The fist is right... Mommy, the fist is on the mantle right now in the family room. You don't think we're militant? It's a metal black power fist in the center of the family room. One, it's not metal. Okay. <laughs> what is it made of? It what is it made of? Mommy, it's I a don't... black power fist. That's the point. Why is that militant? You don't think having a black power fist in the center of your... Of, of where you hang out as a family, a black power fist. You know, I'm not saying militant is bad. I'm not saying it's bad at all. I just want you to acknowledge that's a little extra. That's not so. regular black. That's extra black. A black power fist in the living room? What's wrong with you didn't even power? put it in the basement. Why hide it in the basement? We are black. We are black. And I believe in black power. We work very hard. But you don't think the fist in the living room is a sign of militancy? No. Do you think most people have a black power fist in, in their living room? They may not. If someone were to come in, I don't think they would take offense to it. Most of the people that come in here are black. And? Why would they take offense to it? Ain't no white people coming in here. We've had some white people. Who? Here. Who? Who? Larry brought some people in from his office once. Daddy been retired for like three years. You were saying during your lifetime. Mommy, who? You can count like five white people to have been in this house in, in 30 years. So they've been here. Did anybody ever comment on the Black Power Fist? No. They haven't commented on the Black Power Fist. They haven't commented on the artwork. We have no white people on these walls. If you're listening, there's no white people on these walls. Really? There's a picture of Daddy and, and, and Bill Clinton. That's it. There's the only white person on any of the walls in this whole house. The whole house. And we got a lot of art on the walls. I really hadn't noticed. You did notice. You did that intentionally. No, we bought art that we liked. That looked like you and daddy. Where'd the Black Power Fist come from? Your father had it when I married him. He said he got it the day Angela Davis got out of jail. And you don't think that that's extra? You don't think that's like extra black? Like kind of black, militant black? You went and bought a metal Black Power Fist on the day Angela Day. I'm sorry, what is it made of again? Because you said it's not metal. I think it's concrete. So you went and bought either a metal... He, no, he. He. He went and bought a metal, either a metal or concrete black power fist on the day Angela Davis was freed from jail. And we really going to have a conversation about whether y'all are militant. No. Any tips for people who are going out protesting or, hell, rioting? Any, anything you'd like to share with the people? I would recommend that people go out and protest, not riot. What should they take with them if, they pro if they're going to protest? They should wear comfortable shoes. You mentioned knee pads. They should have bottled water and milk. For the eyes. For the eyes. Tear in gas. case there's tear gas. Anything else? Be safe and run like hell if you need to. Thank you, Mother. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Isn't she the best? I love Mum Mum. I don't think you understand how I had to beg my mother to do the show. My own mother. She was like, I don't think they want to hear from me. I was like, really? They've been begging to hear from you. So thank you, mom, for doing the show. My dad said he would do the show next week, but I won't believe him until the show is actually taped. I have another guest this week. Even before the entire country broke out into protest, I was already struggling with angst and anxiety. COVID-19, over 100,000 people dying from the disease, all of us walking around in face masks, this new world order that we're living under with social distancing and phases of openings. And this should have been the second thing I said after 100,000 people dead. 40 million people are out of work. Craziness has happened. Personally, like I've had several projects put on hold. I also moved out to L.A., to work in the TV and film industry 
and the industry doesn't currently exist anymore. Like it'll come back eventually, but when? So it's it's stressful. And then the whole nation erupted in protest. Another viral video of a black man being murdered, narrating his own death, is the phrase that CNN likes to use. It's a lot. I've avoided watching the video in its entirety, but every news channel loves to play snippets from the video, which is a whole separate thing, the way people are so comfortable seeing black death. I can't ever remember a video of a white man fighting for his life or being murdered on camera, widely circulating on the news. I want an expert to come on and talk with us about that. I need historical context for that. I know it goes back to lynching, but I need someone to break it all down for me. That said, that video is a lot, even listening to the video, because sometimes it'll come on, I can't find the remote and I just turn away. But to hear a man crying for his mother, his deceased mother, no less, is a lot is my favorite word to use when I don't really want to delve into my emotions, but it's painful. I know that I am stressed out. I am not sleeping well. I'm not focusing in the way that I should. I know that other people are probably dealing with similar issues. The other day when I was re-dyeing my hair, it's like super pink now. I had the news on blast and an expert was on, black man. I didn't catch his name, but he was talking about black people and the trauma of police brutality, specifically police murders. And he said, when a black person is killed by the police, it doesn't just affect. So I I thought a little counseling was in order. I know I needed some help and I figured other people may need some help managing all this going on as well. You experience anxiety, stress, depression, PTSD as a result of this murder. And I thought to myself, and I was like, really, like the whole city, 90 days of PTSD over someone that they don't know? And I'm like, yeah. All last episode, I referred to George Floyd as Greg Floyd. My ex-husband is named Greg. My ex-husband was 6'2", dark skin, and and a broad-shouldered man. He doesn't look like George Floyd per se, but he fits the phenotype. And clearly, as I kept saying his name last episode... I was unconsciously thinking about him. Things didn't work out between us, but God, I don't want the man murdered by police. The thought of it is horrifying. So when the expert said, you know, these are the things that happen, people get stressed out. Yeah, because you see these murders of, of black men. And as a black woman, I look, I think that could be my father. That could be my son. That could be my cousin. That could be my friend. That could be my nephew. That could be my ex-husband. You see these horrifying videos of black trauma, the students in that car at Atlanta. You know how many times I sat in a car cupcaking with somebody's son, shooting the shit, losing track of time. That girl could have been me. That guy could have been anybody I've ever dated. It's a lot. So I called up Lisa Jones Chandler. She is a friend of the podcast. This is not her first time on Ratchet and Respectable. She is a licensed clinical social worker in the state of New York, and she assists adults in living healthier lives. Her areas of interest include, but are not limited to, women's issues, college students, living with symptoms of depression and anxiety, mental health stigma in the African-American Caribbean community, and potential stressors transitioning from youth to adulthood. Please welcome Lisa Jones Chandler to Ratchet and respectable. How are you right now? Um, <laughs> doing has been my new response. Doing counts. Doing counts. Thank you. Thank you. Um, which was the same response I had for you yesterday. Like, it was the first thing I asked you. Because I just, it, it's just, what a time. It's unspeakable. Many times I am speechless. I am at a loss for words to describe what is even happening. We have all been scared into having to think about our mortality. That is scary for many people. A lot of people do not like to think, plan, or talk about death. 
now be in a situation where we have this silent infection that can be deadly to anyone, right? Because remember in the beginning, we didn't think we got it. And here we are um, being infected at a massive rate and dying at a massive rate. And then you add on top of that, the trauma of knowing that another another black person, yet another, yet another, yet another. Mm-hmm. One of the reasons I wanted to speak to you is the majority of my listeners, they're black women, which means they're the moms, they're the sisters, they're the aunties, they're the daughters. They carry an extraordinary amount of responsibility for the well-being of others. And black women very often just culturally just tend to put ourselves on the back burner. We make sure that everyone else is good before we look out for ourselves. And I wanted to make sure that in this time where there's so much going on, that we take a moment to center ourselves and to to put ourselves first and to make sure that we are okay. I've had this conversation with myself, with my girlfriends, with my loved ones about how important it is to do that, even more so now. What would you suggest that... In the middle of all of this, you know, people are very stressed out. I'm sure you're seeing clients who are more stressed, more anxiety, more everything I think is heightened Mm -hmm. right now. What would you recommend for people who are like, you know, I am not okay, and this is a lot? I think it's important that we recognize what has been happening for at least the the last three months is trauma. I want to hone in on that word just a little bit because I think For us in our community, we don't use it a lot. We don't understand what trauma means or we associate it with something so extreme that we forget trauma is on a scale. In March, I remember having a conversation with one of my girlfriends and she was talking about not being able to fall asleep at a good time and is typically an early riser and is pretty sharp at work, really intelligent black woman. And I simply said, well, this is a trauma response. She was struck by that. And many of my friends and family were like, what, huh? is that what this is? Like just genuinely confused about how their bodies were responding. And I think it's important that we identify and define what that is because in doing that, we can raise our awareness of, okay, I am cranky. I am confused. I'm a little agitated. I'm oversleeping, I'm not eating, I'm overeating. When you can put a name to it, sometimes that helps normalize what's going on for you and everyone else. We probably all need counseling or therapy right now, like every (laughs) single one of us. But for those of us who are not, you know, running out to a counselor or a therapist, but we just need to manage, like we need to get through today and tomorrow. Can you give three tips to like help? Breathe. When I say breathe, be in touch with your body rate, like how you're breathing. Because there are times I know that I've been watching the news and I don't, I think I hold my breath. You can decide how you want to do it. I encourage people to sometimes even during the day take 10 deep breaths, maybe in between meetings, because that's been a hot topic about how to deal with coworkers and an employer that is not addressing the uprising. I usually, I, I always encourage people to take 10 deep breaths. Um, if you can't, if you don't have the time to do 10, start with one, do as many as you can. You can meditate if you want. I really talk a lot about Headspace. I'm a New York City resident, and so Headspace is free until the end of the year for New York um, residents. And their meditations are wonderful, and they are as little as one minute. And I think that when we think about meditation, we think about, oh, an hour, and I don't have an hour to do this, and I can't. Um, be alone with my thoughts for that long and so a lot of people don't know that you can start off really slow and Headspace allows you the app allows you to do that so you can start off with one minute you can pick the gender voice that you prefer Um, you can pick the category in terms of do you want to be relaxed do you want to concentrate eat and I've been talking to a lot of people who are not eating I have been guilty of this myself just by the time I'm moving through the day and dealing with all the stresses of the world, I'm like, I didn't even eat breakfast, right? So reminders to eat are important, right? To sustain yourself. And the mindful 
consumption. And I'm sure you're guilty of it because I'm guilty of it as well, where I'll have my phone in my hand, the TV's on, and I may or may not have my laptop or iPad. All three devices are talking to me about the national uprising. And then I'm probably coming out of windows talking to my friends in group chats about the uprising. That is overstimulation. And then what ends up happening is this trauma loop that we can't seem to get our brain and nervous system out of because now we have trained our bodies to consume this traumatic information constantly to manage the anxiety and fear we may be feeling. And then here we are again. It's like, no, I should, I should disconnect, but I can't disconnect because I want to know what's happening. And then you use the overconsumption to manage your anxiety. And here we are again. It's important to understand what your body is doing during this time. It's important to disconnect from social media and the news and to connect with people, your loved one, your spouse, your friend, your children. I, I hear people say, I'm triggered, I'm triggered. That's okay. That's your body's way of saying, pay attention. Do you have any specific tips for, for the corporate women, for the women who are, you know, you've got to do your Zoom calls, you've got to take calls, you've got to interface with your coworkers, anything specific for them? Because they're going through it. I contemplated not going to work all this week um, because of the national uprising and what it was doing to me. And I know a lot of conversations I've been having with my friends and colleagues that I have in the industry is about how do you deal with this national uprising and then the silence at your company, it, the silence is deafening. Um, and we are already working from home during a crisis and now have to deal with working with people who aren't even acknowledging the targeted killing of our people. And, hey, how are you? How was your weekend? It, it, there's a underpinning of just being tone deaf there that you may have been doing well right now. like, And then you hear that in a meeting and you're instantly triggered and angry. What do you do in that moment? For black women, remember we talked about this with anxiety, we hold a lot of our stress in our bodies. And so the deep breathing really allows for you to let it out. The deep breathing tips in between Zoom meetings, I would definitely encourage that. The meditating for at least one minute, just even sometimes I tell my clients, just close your eyes or put the timer on your phone in between meetings. Close your eyes. Also, activate your Black Girl Tribe, please. I have an incredible group of industry Black women who have been my lifeline. We formed this as some type of trauma response because we were dealing with so many different challenges just by being black and working in America, but just during this time, organize your crew. You have to find ways to feed into your and pour into yourself when you are dealing with the microaggressions of your workplace and this country. And they don't even feel micro anymore. It's just aggression. I, I love a good vent session just in general, like just to call somebody and just go off, use all the, you know, the F-bombs that I would love to um, and just get it out, you know? Yeah, because yeah, then, then you can move on. And what's happening to a lot of us is that when you don't let it out, you can't run, it's unresolved. Like women sometimes we, we don't speak out as much as we should. And so even more reason to find that one person to talk to have a Zoom lunch. To create a new ritual and healing space for yourself now that you have these different working conditions while in crisis. I love that. I was watching CNN because this is what I do most of the day. <laughs> and Van Jones was on and he was talking about his older son wrote a letter to his principal and he was concerned about the younger brother going outside to play because he didn't want his younger brother to become a hashtag. Kids are seeing and they're taking in all this information and they may not be processing it well. So mm -hmm. what would you recommend parents say to kids and how to keep, make sure your kid's not like, you know, stressing out and full of anxiety and trauma as well? These conversations are really painful to have. Um, 
but I've had to have them with my godchildren who are like anywhere from eight to 20 and really educating them, arming them with information, unfortunately, of the cruelties of this world. And I'm sure you have many stories where, you know, black children lose their innocence so early by having to learn about what isn't right and what isn't fair simply because the color of their skin. And I always, I think, parents sometimes, we don't give our children enough credit for how incredibly smart they are and how quickly they can come to an assessment without having much information. And I usually tell parents, I said, you, you got to go where your child is. Sometimes, especially in the black community, like to put this face on for our children and tell them, no, it's going to be okay. And okay, it might be okay, but then it might not be. And we need to be the role models for our children. And sometimes that means being really vulnerable and really raw. Um, that means crying with your children if they ask a question and explaining to them that there are really evil people in this world that make judgments just by how you look and really having those heartfelt, educated conversations with your children, again, because if not you, then who? I think a lot of what happens to us as parents is that we want to shield our kids from all pain, every pain. And we know that's not realistic, but we're going to try. But I also think that we owe it to our children to be vulnerable and to not pretend like this is okay and to show a little anger about it. Because, again, not only are we teaching our children the way, but we're also showing them how to respond to life. And so if we put this mask on all the time, and we're not really transparent, and we're not really vulnerable, then, then what are we really doing? We're teaching them to do the same thing when they get older, to stuff and park their feelings. I encourage parents to kind of do the work themselves, right? Like, what's happening for you? What's going on right now? And then you have to put that aside, and you have to talk to your children. And if you show emotion, that's okay. You're teaching them how to be human. There is power in transparency. And courage to talk about these painful topics with your children. It's why our parents had it with us. It's why they had to talk with us to say, this is what you do in the event. You are stopped by authorities and I am not with you, right? You give them information. Thank you so much. Anytime. Super. It's a pleasure speaking to you. I know you have like your circle of friends, but I extend this to everyone I've been talking to. Like I am here if you need to vent, if you need to curse, if you need to scream, I am available to you. Oh, Demetria, that is so lovely for you to say. Because, you know, you're like my friend in my head. So oh. I feel like the quick way for me to, like, catch up on what's going on in pop culture. I wish I could go back to doing pop culture. Like, I've become, like, a political pundit all of a sudden. And I'm like, I want to talk about stupid shit. I want to talk about men with, like, gray sweatpants. You want to go back to, you know, the rules. Exactly. You know the rules. Like all this political and and hypersensitive and declaring war on DC. It's just it's a lot. It's a lot. It's 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 a lot. It's heavy, but find time for that. I love the subject and title of your podcast last week because it was similar to what I had been saying all week. I was like, We we are not okay. We have not been okay. And we won't be okay for a while, right? But we're going to be all right. But we are not okay. We are not okay. We just sit in that and be uncomfortable. And I don't want to hear about your discomfort because I've been uncomfortable since I was born. We have to find those moments of joy every day. So we're not telling, again, like the trauma looping and teaching your body how to respond to stress. So we can kind of undo this default setting of constantly talking about stressful events. The distraction is needed. It's, it's very healthy. It's appropriate. But thank you for the offer because I will take you up on it. Please do. <laughs> Isn't she great? And I appreciate her. When I reached out to Lisa, we were trying to schedule a time for the interview. She was working with the suicide prevention hotline. Apparently, it's all hands on deck right now. Between COVID-19 and now the protests, a lot of people are on edge. A lot of people are in crisis. So that is, that's not it, actually. Last episode, 
I don't remember what I was referring to, but it had to do with somebody lying. And I referred to Jesse Williams instead of Jesse Smollett. My bad. Apparently, I was really stressed out last week. I do two rounds of edits for the podcast and then do a listen through. I messed up George Floyd's name and called Jesse Jesse. Thank you to those of you who pointed out the mistakes. Most of you were very kind. Some of you, not so much. It was an accident. I try to do my best with this podcast. I am working alone here. It is a worthwhile but laborious process to get the podcast up, and I don't have a team right now. When I make mistakes, I don't mind you bringing them to my attention, but please charge it to my head and not my heart. I am literally doing the best that I can. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode of Ratchet and Respectable, please subscribe on whatever platform you are listening on. If you would like some Ratchet and Respectable in your life before the next episode, you can give me a follow on social media at at Demetria L. Lucas. Okay, that's really everything. We'll talk soon. Okay, bye. The holiday season is right around the corner. And this year, we know that people will be buying more stuff online than ever before. If you're an e-commerce seller, are you ready to meet the demands of a record-breaking online shopping season? Be ready with ShipStation. It's the fastest, easiest, and most affordable way to manage and ship my orders. I've been talking about doing these signed books for Don't Waste Your Pretty for a couple months now. ShipStation is my go-to to get those books to you on time. No matter where you're selling, Amazon, Etsy, your own website, that would be me. ShipStation brings all your orders into one simple interface. It's no wonder ShipStation is the number one choice of online sellers. You'll ship more in less time with the best rates available. And right now, Ratchet and Respectable listeners can try ShipStation free for 60 days when you use offer code RESPECT. Make sure your business is ready to meet the demands of a massive online shopping season. Get started at ShipStation.com today. Click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in RESPECT. That's ShipStation.com. Then enter offer code RESPECT. ShipStation.com. Make ship happen.